Okay, we're going to get started. My name is Steve Friedland, and I'm the moderator of this session. And like I said, uh, first of all, welcome everybody. This is a session on teaching tips from some terrific teachers <clears throat> who are going to present um, from their own perspective things that can help new law teachers. I can tell you that while I've been teaching for a long time, I look forward to this because I know I'm going to learn something as well. I don't think you're ever too old to, to learn. I'm going to frame this session briefly and then turn it over to them. And then we're going to have some Q&A at the end. That's how we're generally going to frame our uh, work today. And let me just say that while this is on teaching tips, one thing I will tell you is that it's really not about us as teachers. It's about students as learners and how they can learn. And while we focus on classes often, we're really sometimes talking way beyond classes and the practices and habits that students can develop over time and take with them, not just as students, but as lawyers. So it's really a long-term endeavor. And of course, the traditional pedagogy for lawyer, lawyers in their training is still the Socratic method. But neuroscience and learning theory have shown that there's a lot more out there and lots of different ways to approach our courses. And I just wanna make a few comments before I turn it over to them um, and get their own views. One thing we all know is that we as teachers can't force students to learn. And the learning theory suggests all we can do is create learning environments. And there are environments that the theorists have talked about, including knowledge-based, which is about the what. There's also learner-based environments where we talk about who's out there and try to meet them as students. There's also assessment-based environments. And last but not least, community-based environments. And you're gonna hear about each of these from our teachers here today, uh, how these environments can be created to maximize learning. And I think that's really important because we can deliver a lot of information, but if they don't receive it and if they don't retain it and then be able to retrieve it, according to the neuroscientists, it doesn't really count. One last point, and this is really promoted by the pandemic and the social unrest that's occurred in this last year. The neuroscience says that when people learn, they don't just learn cognitively, the cognition and emotional parts of our brain work together. So that if someone is depressed or stressed or anxious, they may not learn as well. And in fact, don't. The study that shows that people who are shown smiling faces learn more actually. So I think it's really important as we go forward, not just to look at the cognitively related learning, but also how do we help our students promote self-care? How do we help them promote balance? And I know that um, I've taken this from others, but I started talking to students about what are they doing to promote self-care? Because it doesn't just start and end in law school. They need that as lawyers. So just a few preliminary remarks. Now I'm going to turn it over to our experts from, who all have books at West and Foundation, and they're in different series. And that's why they were selected in part. They're all excellent teachers, but they're going to give us some different approaches to how we can run our classrooms. So leading off is going to be Miriam Cherry, who's gonna talk about teaching with current events. She's gonna be followed by Debbie Jones Merritt and the flipped classroom. And then Ben Spencer is gonna talk about cold calling, study groups and assessment. Deborah Gordon is then gonna talk about learning goals and assessment. And Martha Ertman is gonna talk about assessments and interactivity. And last but not least, Noah Feldman is gonna be talking about shaping the law. And I'm not gonna quiz you on these in the order, but that's what you're gonna see. So I'm gonna turn it over to uh, Miriam Cherry now for five to seven minutes. That's what each is going to present on. And if you have questions, please put them in the chat. And we're gonna to try to reach those afterwards if we can. Miriam, all yours. All right, thank you so much, Steve. And I appreciate so much the context that you gave us particularly during this past year when we've had so many difficulties and so many people are teaching online or in hybrid formats. Thank you also to West Academic for hosting this panel. And I really wanna to say to all of the attendees, congratulations. I know this is a panel focused on new law professors and you really are embarking on what I consider the most wonderful career. So uh, let me go ahead and start by sharing my screen. 
And I'm gonna be focusing uh, today, my remarks on using current events in your classroom. So I think some topics generally seem to be more current events focused and other doctrinal subjects, for example, if we're talking about property law, contracts, trust and estates, those kinds of courses, it can be a lot more difficult to work in what's happening in the real world into, into your book. And so I wanted to talk more about that and what some of the advantages are of trying to do that. First of all, I think it provides a way, a new context of applying some of the older doctrines that may be in books and using them in a context that students are familiar with. And in that application, they're really gonna boost their learning. Second, as Steve mentioned, you really can't make anybody learn in a sense, as much as we might want to. We need to get students engaged, we need to get them involved, we need to capture their attention. And so one way to do that is to be using current events. And third, I also think that this approach using current events is something that I found really beneficial in bringing more diversity and inclusion into the law school classroom. And I'll talk about how and why uh, I think that's so. So first of all, I, I, would, I just wanna talk about what these folks have in common. This is not a, a riddle entirely, but Megadeth, Sandra Bullock, 50 Cent, and Lady Gaga. I think uh, the, the end up uh, is that they are all actually the subject of various contract disputes and cases. And so I end up using celebrities, people that students know in order to, uh, it, it, for real life disputes, in order to get them a sense of uh, the real world aspects of what's going on in, in the course. And sometimes these are, are quite interesting and, and things I hadn't even known or heard about. When I was in law school, I never read about this case in contracts, but, uh, and when you go to the Chicago Field Museum and you see the Tyrannosaurus Rex Sue, you wouldn't necessarily know that there was an enormous contract dispute that had dragged on for years about who owns Sue. But when you dig into it, pun intended, you actually see that there's so many different issues that are going on in this case. So the fact that the fossil was found on Native American land, um, there was only a payment of $6,000, but it later sold at auction for $10 million, which brings up quite a number of contract offenses, including fraud and misrepresentation and unconscionability. I use this as a way to get students to talk about what the defenses are and how they how they can be used, but it's something that was that was in the in the news and going on um, uh, about 20 years ago, and yet it was something that, that no one ever talked about. And I, I was kind of stumbled upon the case by accident. Uh, one of the adopters of my contracts textbook actually does an entire day just on the legal issues around Sue, specifically using it as a way to explore uh, Native American law. There are other cases that I think are really fascinating. Like, for example, just a couple of years ago, the Banksy case of the self-destructing painting uh, purchased at auction for millions of dollars, and then it immediately started to destroy itself in front of shocked viewers at the auction. And more recently, I've incorporated this material into the second edition of the book, force majeure clauses, which are normally a very, very dry area where I've lost students numerous times going over the material. But now there's the opportunity to talk about this in the context of the pandemic and what it meant for all of the Broadway shows closing down. So I want to just point out that this is all uh, part of engagement. And as I mentioned in the beginning, it's one of the main reasons, I think, to go down this path or to try to use current events in your class. Because especially in this world of hybrid and online instruction, the more things you can do to make those connections, to take things that are going on in the world and then make them part of what you do in your application of your, your classes, I think that's just gonna uh, benefit, uh, uh, be a big benefit. The next thing is that you get really positive student feedback for doing this. Students absolutely love this. It encourages them to get more involved in the subject. And I've had so many comments that have said, you know, I didn't really know I was all that interested in this subject until we started getting into the, some of the current events. And so this is just a quote from one of my students who says uh, at the end here, I especially love the hypothetical examples at the end of each chapter because they were based on pop culture. So the last reason I think it's a great idea to incorporate current events into your classes is that I do think that this is a way to increase inclusion and diversity within the classroom. And so I, I think that modern cases, at least I'm talking about my particular milieu of uh, contract law, 
But if we talk about modern cases, we're going to get more diverse examples than if we look at just what happened in industrializing England and the development of some of the doctrines. Now, granted, that material is there, and you know, students, it's good to have a historical perspective. But in addition, I've added material on critical legal studies, racial wealth gap, and feminist theories of contract in order to really give students an idea of how this could fit into other uh, theories and, and um, ways of, of analyzing the law. And the other thing is that I, I truly believe in, in also changing around some of the hypothetical conventions. I tend to have examples in my class and in, in the book and in the teacher's manual that go beyond what I'm gonna call the Bob and Sally problem. So you wanna make sure, I think in, you know, I think a lot about this as a, as a professor and, uh, and casebook author, but that you're being inclusive in the way you, the naming conventions are working. And, um, and so I, I do think that that's very important. I can talk a little bit about that more in Q and A. But so um, just a couple more things, this isn't necessarily about current events, but I do think that these are, are things to think about definitely as you go into teaching uh, your initial classes. But you know, find and use resources that are available to you. So for example, examining uh, the teacher's manual, it, it sometimes uh, new professors have told me they feel really guilty looking at it or using it. You should not, this is absolutely designed to help you out. And in fact, I would say it's, it's really critical. Um, so are there briefs provided for the cases? Are there answers? Are there rubrics set up for trying to do some of the assessment that you're gonna hear about from some of the other professors on the panel? Are those things set out in the teacher's manual? You know, you should look for that. Um, again, you can use these things as a jumping off point. You know, if a book comes with PowerPoint slides, uh, those are things that are going to be helpful to you as you get started, and then you can make them your own, you know, and, uh, but that's going to save you a lot of time. My other suggestion, finding a teaching mentor, um, whether that's at your institution, whether that's outside of your institution, but it, it could be subject matter, it could just be someone who knows technology really well. When I started out as a new law professor, uh, there was one professor on our faculty who was just terrific with PowerPoints and polling and all sorts of things like that technologically. And he was just so incredibly helpful to me starting out. And also we're all here as casebook authors because we enjoy talking with new law professors. And so um, find people who are interested in, um, in becoming mentors. Uh, that's, that's why we're here. So um, uh, this is the book that I've been talking about, just throwing that in as a bit of a uh, shameless self-promotion here. And I will just conclude by saying that I do think that there's something about using current events that really engages students and gets them to ask more questions and gets them intrigued. And so this is the quote, education is not the filling of a pail, but the lighting of a fire. And to get that kind of robust discussion and engagement, I know that our next speaker is gonna be talking about the flipped classroom. And that's certainly a way to get the students to do a lot of that intellectual work and heavy lifting uh, by having them work on problems. So I'll stop there and turn it over to Professor Merritt. Thank you. Um, and if you stop your screen share, I will start mine in a minute, but I'll start by echoing everything that Miriam's just said from the thanks to West for putting this on, to congratulations to all of you watching this, to uh, all of the great points that she made about teaching. And as she suggested, I will pick up by starting with talking about flipping the classroom. Um, so what is flipping the classroom? That's actually a strange phrase, I think, because it suggests that you have to do something different than what you've done before. And people now do so many different things in the classroom that I'm not sure it makes sense to really talk about, say to somebody, you need to flip your classroom or you should consider flipping your classroom. So what I think of it as is, what is the best way that we can use a really unusual period of time? We have somewhere between 50 to 100 minutes. Uh, we have anywhere from 10 to 100 students and we have one professor. And what justifies bringing all these people together for this particular period of time? How do you get the most out of that particular time? And I would suggest that um, the beginning answer to this is to use less lecture and more engagement, because if you find yourself talking for more than 10 minutes, more than any of us will individually hear, you really have to ask, am I making the best use of this time? Why are all these people gathered here just to hear me speak? 
couldn't they, wouldn't it be better for them to listen to me on a video where they could listen at their leisure and replay and so forth? If you're gathered that many people who've come together at one time in one place, engagement of some sort is usually the best way to use that period of time. Before you decide what kind of engagement you want to have, uh, you need to think about what two things. The first is, what do you want your students to learn? Um, are they learning legal rules in your class? If so, how detailed does their knowledge have to be? Are you teaching them how to read cases, read rules and statutes, apply principles to new problems, how to work in groups? Uh, as we start moving experiential learning into the doctrinal classroom, or for those of you who are experiential teachers here, are you teaching them how to write, how to negotiate, how to counsel clients? Chances are that you're planning to do at least two and maybe three of these things. Um, I would counsel you against trying to do all of them. Uh, it is really hard to do all of these things in one class. Um, the things that I focus on when I teach evidence, which is the course I'll be talking about here, are teaching some legal rules, uh, the legal rules, federal rules of evidence, how to read rules and statutes, and how to apply legal principles to new problems. I don't worry about teaching students how to read cases. In fact, the case book that I write with um, Rick Simmons is actually called the Uncase Book because it doesn't have any cases in it, not one. <laughs> we have some examples, lots of examples and analyses that are based on cases, but we don't think that the second year or third year evidence class is a good place to teach people to read cases. Um, evidence is really about the rules. Uh, and there's a lot that people need to learn about how to read rules. The other thing you need to know before you plan an engaged classroom is, what are the students going to do before class? Are they reading a traditional casebook, other materials, watching a video, working in groups, preparing problems? Now, you most likely control this, so it's really a question of how you're going to integrate your pre-class assignments with what you're going to do in class. In um, When I teach evidence, and I'm going to show you a few slides that are pictures from the book that I teach from. This is the learning evidence book, which was the first in a series that West has now called the learning series. And all of the books are set up something like um, what I'm going to show you here. So we, again, I, as I mentioned, we think it's important to be teaching people rules, how to read rules, literal rules in the evidence course. And so each chapter opens with the rule that we're going to be looking at. Uh, and we underline the key phrases or words, the things that really make a difference in applying this rule. We follow that up with a, a sort of first, second, third, going through those underlying phrases. What do you have to think about with respect to each of these phrases? What kinds of issues might arise? We then, in the rest of the chapter, we have what's called the in the courtroom section, in which we have a series of examples and analyses like this gathered under specific sub-principles for these different rules. This is what we have instead of cases. These are often taken from real cases and we give citations to them, but we're doing two things here, I think. One is we're giving people a model for really concise legal writing. Uh, these are the facts, this is the analysis. Uh, and you know the, the appellate opinions and evidence are not really all that well written, I'll say. Um, it's not the area that people really care about writing uh, wonderfully thoughtful opinions because they're in the end going to defer to the discretion of the trial judge anyway. So we wanted to give people some examples of good writing, and we also thought that this would take them through the material much more readily uh, than they could if they were reading long and badly uh, written appellate cases. Then um, we have various sections of the book where we use icons to show people, you know, here's how you might put this type of material together. Uh, this icon means here we have a, a clear rule of law, but it really uh, depends on the facts. It's very fact specific. Uh, and so we have different icons to show that. So people have read a lot about the doctrinal material before they come to class. They also, um, when we start flipping, um, they have some out of class activities that are more engaged. We've created a number of online simulations in which students get to play either a judge or a lawyer in the courtroom. Uh, raising or ruling on objections in real time. So that's what the students do um, before they come to class. And then when they come to class, one of the things that I do at the beginning of the semester is I seat them actually in groups. Um, this was something I came up with a couple of years ago when I taught in a room that was way too large for the size of my class. So I had you can consider this the front of my seating chart. What I did was I blacked out um, certain seats so that I created these clusters, the green clusters of four or five seats 
are students who at any point in the class I can, if I want them to do group work, I can say that's your group. I let them choose their groups. Other professors would assign them. There's good arguments on both sides for that. But this type of seating is something that I find facilitates the type of interactive work that I do. What I do then in class is um, I often start out with some clicker hypotheticals. These may be fairly easy ones that I expect each student to answer on their own to remind them of the rules they've read about and to begin applying them to facts. I often use celebrities or things in the news. One of the great things about evidence is you can find an evidentiary issue anywhere you look. Um, I then move to more difficult hypotheticals where I ask them to consult with their group. I use simulations uh, in the classroom. I sometimes use writing exercises. I will ask them how to rewrite a particular uh, rule or how to rewrite something that would be subject to a rule. And the last thing I want to say, having gone through this, is that when I say simulations, um, you know, trial practice like simulations are really good in an evidence class, not for teaching trial practice, because they'll take a whole nother class on that, but because we think, um, Steve told you, we think not just cognition, but emotion. We also think in space. And anything that you see happen in three-dimensional space is much easier to remember. So I sometimes will have students simply act out for the rest of the class the way that you would refresh a witness's memory, because that will then help them remember the concept better. It's not that I'm going to test them as a trial practice course, but it's a way of enhancing the concepts. I'll stop there and look forward to hearing the ideas from everybody else. OK, Ben, you're up. Hello, everyone. and. Uh... Congratulations to those of you who are just starting out in the profession. This is a, a great uh, field to be in. Uh, so I'm excited on your behalf. Um, and I'm also very honored to be included among this esteemed group of, of very outstanding teachers. Um, I'm just gonna talk briefly about one of the methods that I used in my civil procedure class for calling on people. Uh, when I went to law school, all of my courses, for the most part, were just random cold calling. And I started out doing things that way. Uh, but then I quickly morphed into a hybrid cold call panel system that I wanted to share with you. Uh, and the way that it works is I divide my class into teams of, let's say, five or six people on each team. And I call these SEAL teams. And... It, it stands for, these are teams that provide support, engagement, assessment, and learning. And the idea is that before each class, no team knows which team I'm going to call on. And so everyone still has that incentive to read and be prepared for class because their team might be called on. Then at the beginning of the class, I announce which team I'm going to call on for that day. At that point, the people who aren't on the team that I've called can enter a, a, a more relaxed mode where they're paying more attention and it, it can kind of facilitate their focus uh, as opposed to having ongoing anxiety about being called on throughout the rest of the class. So they, they know at that point they're off the hook, uh, but then you've got the remaining people there who are on the, the indicated team, the five or six people, uh, they're there uh, and I limit my cold calling, if you will, to the people on that team. Now that doesn't preclude other people who are not on that team from volunteering a response uh, or participating in the class. So they're not uh, excluded, but my, my questions that, that I'll direct will uh, be to, to that team. An additional benefit then is if someone is struggling a little bit with a response, and this is, you know, civil procedure is what I teach, and this is in the fall of the first year when people are or just, just fresh out of college or, or new to, to law school. Uh, so if there's some struggle uh, in terms of someone's answer, people who are members of their team are encouraged to uh, chip in and help out. And um, I've seen some people or some teams almost take a group approach to responding to questions or uh, hand it off or consult with each other uh, and, and try to collaborate in responding uh, to the questions. Now, in addition to the use inside of the classroom, what I do with these teams is I set up a series of what I call tutorials throughout the semester. And this, these are three sessions where I'll meet individually with each team. And what we do during those sessions is the teams have been asked to work on 
old exam questions and some of the practice questions that appear as an electronic supplement to my casebook. And it's also available to, in many casebooks in the West uh, academic system. This is called Casebook Plus. And there's a series of 300 multiple choice questions that come uh, with Casebook Plus. Uh, and the team members will work on some of these questions, they'll work on old exam questions that I've assigned to them. And then when we meet in these tutorials, I'll walk through and discuss uh, answers uh, with them. And this is an opportunity for formative assessment, which is pretty important uh, as the studies have shown. But it's also an opportunity for me to engage in some coaching so that I'm modeling for them what a, a good response is, what a good analysis is, and trying to train them as we go through the semester on what my expectations are uh, and how they should engage in legal analysis. When I was in law school, there was none of this formative assessment or, or coaching or modeling. You were pretty much on your own and you showed up at the, the final exam. Uh, and that was your first opportunity to demonstrate what you thought would be a good legal analysis. And then that would be the first opportunity to, for the professor to tell you whether that was uh, good or not. And I found it to be more helpful to take my students along throughout the semester and give them multiple opportunities to demonstrate their analysis to me and for me to show uh, what a proper analysis would look like and to, to offer some correction. But also, it's not just about me coaching them, but they're supporting each other. As they work on these things before our tutorials, they've already discussed it and helped each other out. I don't um, allow them to choose their own groups. I do assign the people to these teams uh, randomly. And uh, you know, maybe allowing them to choose would be uh, an alternate approach. Uh, but I found it's pretty good to mix people up uh, who may not otherwise uh, choose each other. It's 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 uh, good for them to meet additional people. Uh, so that's been useful. Another benefit has been it helps me kind of evenly distribute the calling that I do on people in class without bias. I think sometimes if there's just random cold calling, there might be some sort of tendency to call on the same people or maybe to avoid calling on certain people. And with this team uh, approach, uh, that just doesn't happen. It'll be team one or team six is, is on today and whoever's on that team uh, is going to get called on. So I, I found that to be uh, helpful. So um, I'm just going to leave it at that and leave more time for others and for uh, if anyone has questions in the Q&A, uh, happy to, to answer those. Thanks for the opportunity to participate. Thanks, Ben. And we turn it over to Deborah Gordon. Deborah. Thanks. I'm going to um, share my screen. One of the reasons I love um, doing these panels is um, I've already learned a lot from my co presenter so it's a great opportunity. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about um, learning outcomes. I'm going to uh, make the um, primary uh, kind of violation of the PowerPoint rules and I'm going to have a lot of words on some of these screens. Um, some of it is to show pages from the case book, but also some of it is so that the um, the screens the words can be a reference for folks later on. We'll share these PowerPoints and um, I don't expect you to be reading uh, along with me, but they're there as a, as a resource for later. Um, so one of the things that we um, know and we've already heard about is that um, students learn in all different ways. They learn and, and most of the time you'll have a class full of people who learn in different ways and we try different methods. And the one thing that I've um, kind of realized from uh, my years of teaching is that um, great teaching is, is layered. It uses a bunch of different ways to communicate with um, all of the different types of learners. But the other thing that I've um, come to realize is you can never be too transparent. Like, telling students what you hope they get out of what you're doing can be really helpful to them in their um, processing the material. And um, along with that, um, you may already know that the ABA requires law schools to develop learning outcomes. What do we want our graduates to be able to do when they leave uh, law school? And um, they, the ABA requires us to assess how well our students are doing that and also to evaluate ourselves in our program of legal education. And I threw the ABA um, standards up 
um, on the screen just so you have them if you ever want to look at them. But one of the things that um, probably has already happened is that your law school has developed learning outcomes. And my school has, and in my syllabus, I refer generally to some of our learning outcomes, nothing um, so innovative. Um, it's, uh, I, I hope that my course will help graduates or help my students develop um, competence in analysis and problem solving and also seeing themselves in their professional and ethical responsibility. So pretty broad. Um, and for many years, the other thing I've done in my syllabus is to give some learning outcomes for the course as a whole. I teach trusts and estates. And so, for example, I have a list of uh, outcomes that I hope the students will do. I hope that they'll learn to um, read um, the cases and statutes critically and critique trends within inheritance law. Um, so, so I've, I've got a series of, um, of outcomes in my syllabus. But one of the things that um, has happened to me recently and has um, been really helpful in thinking about the way I chunk information is I've We've done a second edition. I, I'm in the Experiencing series at West. So Experiencing Trusts and Estates, we've been working on our second edition. And one of the things we did for every chapter is we start the chapter with the goals for that material. So before the students even get an introduction, it's gonna say, once you, um, following your work with material in this chapter, you should be able to do all of these things. Um, you should be able to, and I'm giving you an example here, it's chapter two, planning for incapacity and the physical act of death. So students who finish this chapter should know the different um, advanced directives. So the primary documents for planning for incapacity. They should be able to distinguish between living wills and healthcare powers. They should be able to locate model um, documents in their jurisdictions. Um, they should be able to evaluate those key, the key provisions and also identify the consequences of failing to have a plan in place. So that's the case case reading piece of it. Um, they should be able to explain the duties under these documents. And they should, if you drop to the bottom, be able to draft some simple clauses. And so starting and each chapter starts with these are the goals for this material these are what we hope students will be able to do at the end of this of this chapter and then throughout and i do this in the classroom with the students but it's part of the book as well there are different assessments to help them achieve those goals so just as an example and again don't bother reading all this but i just wanted to show how it was chunked there might be a, a for each piece of the chapter, a hypothetical with some facts, very traditional law school type of fact pattern, but then also a, a short little drafting, draft a provision that looks like this, and then play the role of an estate planning lawyer who's advising a client to do X. And so there's a variety of different ways that we try to reinforce those learning outcomes. And then the other piece is that at the end of each chapter, there's some comprehensive opportunity for students to pull together the material. So the example that I have here is the students could pick one of the advanced directives, a living will, a healthcare power, or a, a financial power, and they would write to a client and explain what that document does and what the client might want to change in that document to suit the client's needs. So a little opportunity to do some writing. Um, you could do this as group work, you could do it as assignment, or you could do it in the class. But one of the things that thinking about I used to think about my courses backwards. I used to say, oh, the students have to read all this um, in order to have a full trust and estates experience. And in thinking about it from the learning outcomes uh, perspective, um, it, it makes it easier to choose what they what they're reading, what they're doing in the classes, because I can say this is what I hope they'll be able to understand and do by the end of each chunk of material. And it's made me reduce my coverage and hone in on the things that um, I, I have found more important. So that's been really useful to me. Um, and again, like everyone else, I'm happy to um, take um, questions at the end of the um, at the end of the presentation. Okay, thank you for that, Deborah and Martha Ertman, it's all yours. Excellent. We don't um, 
give the kinds of trainings to law professors that other disciplines do. So these moments are really important. And I certainly remember the times where um, people gave me advice, some of which I'll be passing on. Um, that said, I think things have really changed in the last year. And I think they have changed dramatically, um, especially because of COVID. I've been teaching for 25 years and I have completely become a convert to the idea of recorded lecture videos. And so basically, because we don't have a lot of time, I'm going to be talking a little bit about the pedagogy where Steve started and the theory of it and why it is I think that the recorded lectures are going to really um, be more effective in many ways than giving a live lecture. Um, and also, as one, uh, one of the participants mentioned in the chat, we all have limited amounts of time. And if you have to answer the same question about, in my world, um, the contracts, the battle of the forms five times, that is going to, of course, take away time from other things. And if students get that better from recorded lectures, then every end quizzes that is really um, better for everyone. OK, so what I decided to do today is talk about this in, in praise of escalation, which usually you don't hear that, especially living in Washington, D.C., as I do. Um, but the idea is that you start simple and then get more complicated. And I think that's true for all of us as we're learning to teach and, and learning to teach in new ways, as everybody did in the, in the last Last year. So the way I did in the, in the book I have that, um, that I co-edited with um, Billy Solstrom and Deborah 3D, um, we have a lot of videos that we built in with quizzes. So it was very much a relief when um, COVID hit that we had this chunk. But then having done that, I was able to build on that and make do-it-yourself videos in this very room in my home office. And what I have found is that the uh, teaching evaluations were much stronger than they've been, although I hear rumors that's true across the academy. Um, and in fact, my exams were better than I've ever seen. So I don't know it's that students, you know, didn't have so many distractions or whether really these methods work better. And so I'm going to be bringing a lot of them into the classroom when we're back in live in person. So there we start with the in terms of escalation, they're built in very fancy ones that Wes did with Carol Logie um, that are on the book website that um, give just a a, a simple, simple overview. Not a one of them is over five minutes long. And the quizzes we wrote afterwards are deliberately incredibly simple. Just basically, did you pay attention? And that with the idea is to bookmark the terms and the concepts. So then when they read it, then they know what to look for. Very much like other uh, folks on this panel are saying they do with other techniques. Then they read the cases and the, and the statutes. They know a little more. And then there's a lecture video that does what I would have done live in front of a class, which is yammer on for about 10 minutes at the beginning of a class. But the great thing about yammering on in a video is that, as somebody said earlier, you can pause. You can pause and you can repeat and then they'll get also the PowerPoint. So I'm a big fan of those videos. I also have quizzes after every single video, partly just to give them a little skin in the game. Pedagogical theory says that's really important. Multiple chances with very, very low stakes. All these quizzes, um, and there may have been I don't know if there were 60, there were a lot of them um, by the end of the semester, they're 15% of the grade, but they can take them as many times as they want. So they end up going back and using these videos and the quizzes to study for the final because everybody can get a perfect grade on them. So, so it's moving up in complexity toward the practice exam. And then finally, of course, toward the actual exam and having a lot to do. So we start one with the key terms and concepts, two, apply it in the actual cases and the statutes three get a little more complicated with those and then four by the end of it you can do the equivalent at the end of a chapter of say answering bar exam type multi-state bar exam questions um, and what i'd like to do here is talk about a bit of the flipping the classroom i counted the lecture videos as class time i 
think I may do the same thing when we're live in person again, to really just recognize that counts and that they're responsible for it. And then use it, as someone else said earlier on the panel, use that live class time to actually engage and get them to participate. I won't talk about these methods. A lot of them are what you all have seen, but we're moving up toward complexity. We can't start with that. In terms of the time, everybody is stuck with the, you know, only 24 hours in a day. If you can free ride, free ride. Find a set of materials that has some online and assessment materials built into it. The authors have put tons of work and thought into it. There's no reason for you to reinvent that wheel. This is my dean. Shout out to my dean, Donald Tobin. He did this ahead of a lot of other people in tax. But you can also do it on your own. So these are a few samples of do it your own slides that I make. You just make slides and you narrate it on Zoom. Now we all know it's super easy. And that here, this is a more detail where I'm talking about the language from the statute or the language from the restatement section and how it applies. So all these are uh, do it yourself showing how it is and, and, and uh, we'll share all these and I'm very happy to show the actual video to share the video that comes along with it. The idea is to use images to convey um, ideas and, and colors that are consistent in order to convey memorable information and to help it stick. Um, so here again, it's just much more detail, the kind of stuff that would show up on the board if I were live. And I think it's really helpful. So this is our book. Our series is Doctrine and Practice practice since we're all shouting out our own series and there are it's new the they're from 2019 2020 21 um, and the topics are here on this slide for those of you who are interested all of them I think are really trying to push the envelope and provide more interaction more assessment and practice tips along the way and and uh, so our our part of doing that was in videos the theory behind it you probably are familiar with Bloom's taxonomy. Anytime you learn something new, you start really basic with knowledge acquisition and only little by little do you come to apply and analyze. So I don't find it helpful to start saying, why do we have a statute of frauds and require some writings to be, um, some agreements to be memorialized in writing? Because they don't even know what a statute of frauds is. You have to know what it is you're talking about to have a, an intelligent conversation about how it might evolve or look different and that's at least what I think of as my job is to convey a lot of supports, which is why I chose the figure who's got a little a little help going up that mountain, because that's our job, I think, is to give them what we called when I was little, we called it 10 fingers. We're out playing with friends and somebody had to jump over a fence and you'd say, give me 10 fingers. And that's what I think of our job is, is providing them the support so they can get to the complexity of the doctrines where they're likely to get uh, pulled in in practice. So in terms of Bloom's taxonomy, that's a that's a theory I think probably a lot of people know about. It's standard in pedagogical theory of moving up in complexity. Um, scaffolding, I think a lot of people know you have to stand on a scaffold to get higher. Um, one thing that I would like to mention here, because I think we really don't have time, um, although I'm happy to talk about this later, is something I talk about to my students that they really respond well to is the idea of spiraling. And so here, if we take a look at a spiral staircase, I think it really nicely reflects the truth that we introduce a term and concept, we come around, cover a few other things, and then come back to it. So what is a contract? Oh, it's a legally binding promise. What's a promise? Oh, a promise is a manifestation of willing to do something. Oh, which ones are legal and why they're not? And which ones are enforceable and why they're not? And what's so they, they keep going around and around and after after a while, it just becomes intuitive, this basic knowledge acquisition. And our job as professors is to provide that spiraling chance to bookmark how we're back where we were before and we're, and we're different than we were before. And just in terms of what Steve started us off with theory, 
I'm a huge fan of James Lang. These are online videos from um, my casebook. I'd be really happy to, to share those and, and talk with folks about it. What I think is I'm probably getting ready to be done with my time. And what I'd like to do is, is put a shout out for James Lang, who wrote a, um, wrote a book called Small Teaching. He's an English professor and he collapsed a lot of doctrine in pedagogical theory into this great little book and it's quite readable and it's called small teaching because we build our courses little by little we learn something new about how to run a class and you all at the beginning of your teaching careers are just building on how you were taught and building up what's going to be your way of of conveying the beauty and majesty of your subject um, and so he has wonderful examples of small bite-sized ways to implement ideas into your classroom. Um, I guess my bottom line here is uh, scaffolding and spiraling, and it's not that hard to do it yourself. So the second to last slide is, if you can, free ride to the possibility, look, the publishers have fabulous ranges of uh, don't just uh, without thinking, adopt the casebook that you had when you took the course. Really, there's lots of amazing sources, as you can tell from the um, uh, presenters on this panel, take different different views. And then the other is it's not that hard to create PowerPoints. I'm really happy to share my PowerPoints. As Ma uh, Miriam said, lots of authors are very happy to share their PowerPoints. Don't be shy about emailing them and asking them if they are share notes. There's lots of scaffolding that we as more seasoned uh, professors are more than happy to provide to you all who are who are just getting started. So expect to make mistakes. Don't be too embarrassed about making mistakes because we just are, um, I don't know, maybe that's what we get out of this year, to be a little more forgiving of ourselves and a little more forgiving of our students and each other um, for the complexities of all of our lives um, and how we're all working to try to um, do justice to to the rule of law. And uh, I guess as long as we're talking about that, I'll just finish by saying this has been an unbelievable year. I live in Washington, DC. The rule of law is um, in need of friends. And so the role that we all have in conveying it to the next generation of lawyers is an immense um, honor. And I thank you so much for including me in that conversation for that very recent. Thank you, Martha. We're uh, up to our last speaker right now. And uh, Noah Feldman, that's you. Thanks, Steve. I'll try to keep it super short so we have a little bit of time for questions, although I see people are putting them up in the Q&A. First of all, congratulations to all of you. You genuinely have the best job in the world. Um, I would do my job for free. Please don't tell my dean. Um, you know, if I won the lottery tomorrow, I would get up and do the exact same thing. There's no other job that lets you engage with bright young people who want to make the world a better place, enables you to do the writing that you want to do, and also encourages you to expand your own mind in the process. I mean, there's nothing like it. So I get up every day and thank my lucky stars to have a, a job as a law professor, and you guys should too, including when it gets hard, especially when you're grading. And then you should just repeat to yourself again and again and again, I could be a graduate student, I could be a graduate student, I could be, a, and then you would be doing the same amount of grading, but for less money. So that's the only way I know how to get through that. Um, I also want to just say what an incredible treat it was to listen to all these wonderful presentations and to see the incredible range of pedagogical innovation and approaches that all of you are using. It's incredibly impressive, um, inspiring. It also made me feel like um, a boring old uh, dude whose you know, casebook is the big blue casebook. Um, I inherited from Kathleen Sullivan, and so there's a little pizzazz there, but um, still it's the, it's the big blue foundation casebook in constitutional law, um, and whose pedagogy is in many ways um, more connected to some of the traditions of law school teaching than many of uh, the rest of the presenters had. And I just wanna say a word or two uh, about that um, and about its relationship to constitutional law as a field, and also to the huge importance of casebooks. So here's what I want to basically say. Um, taking completely seriously the emerging evidence from learning theory, 
and sometimes from neuroscience, although some of the learning theory poses as neuroscience um, and isn't quite, um, I think it emerges that the most effective tools of education, no matter how you frame and shape them, and I think this is true of all of the presentations that we've heard, are aimed at engaging your students so that they are fully present to what is happening in the classroom in the time that you have. So if you had to sum it all up in one word, I think that word would be presence. And all of the tools, methods, mechanisms that we use are designed to produce a sense of presence. Now, deployed in the wrong way, the bad version of the old fashioned cold calling method, which is wrongly called the Socratic method, um, sometimes turned people off and made them feel the opposite of present. In fact, even if they were being called on, sometimes their people are circulating up somewhere over, up above their heads and are, and are the opposite of present. But if you look back to Socrates, on whom the method is in theory supposed to have been based, you'll notice that he never cold called. He only engaged with students who wanted to engage, with people who wanted to engage. He walked around all the time in a circle with them. And his objective was to engage in a genuine conversation where he explored the thought process of the people who were engaged in learning as a collective group and generated a conversation where people were looking inside themselves to figure out what they really thought. And to me, again, all of these methods are different approaches of aiming at that, but in a heavily contentious field like constitutional law, where what you're studying is in part um, the reality and the history of deep debates, which maybe they have right answers, but no one knows what those right answers are definitively. One of the ways to get people most engaged is to explore and get them to explore what they really think, what they really believe. And I think this should resonate with what you, you heard from all of my colleagues here. Now, in order to do that, I do a couple of things in the classroom and a couple of things with the casebook, and I think they're congruent. The thing that I try to do in the casebook is try to show people that the real world matters and that constitutional law as a body of law has always engaged with the real world. So one of the changes I made in the casebook was to take in each and every case um, historical context and background and political background that explains where these cases come from and just put it smack dab at the beginning of every case in square brackets um, so that you never sit down to read a case without knowing that it's not in a total abstraction, that it comes from somewhere. And you know, if you're doing Dred Scott, which is the case that I begin with, um, which interestingly was not in the case book before I, I uh, took over the case book and I think is important enough to start with, you need to know who was Dred Scott. What was the context of his lawsuit? You know, what was the context of slavery at the time that he was bringing his suit? And that begins the process of people realizing, oh, this matters. This mattered to real people. Dred Scott was a real person. His wife was a real person. And we know a lot about them. And it's possible, therefore, to engage in a more concrete way. And I try to do the same even with contemporary cases by providing that kind of context. So the real world matters. The other thing I try to show them is that the casebook is trying to teach them a body of law. And constitutional law is, in fact, a body of law. And here's where I get to the point of the casebook as a artifact, as a physical textual artifact. A casebook, at least in a field like constitutional law, is an abridgment of the most important cases an organizational presentation of those cases, and in an important way, a statement of why those cases matter. In other words, it's a statement of the law of the field. And no, I always tell my students, no human being reads the entirety of a Supreme Court opinion ever, including in many cases, the parties to that opinion, um, unless you're about to argue a case or write a brief and you're citing a case and then you better make sure you read the entirety of the case. Other than that, everybody who learns constitutional law, which is just about every lawyer, learns constitutional law through a case book. And that means the job of the case book editor is to do what I'm in the middle of doing this week and next week and the week after every year, which is go through the Supreme Court's constitutional law cases and edit them. I chop them up. You know, if I see that Justice Kagan gave me two paragraphs of rhetoric that I don't think were important to the holding, I cut those paragraphs and I have no choice but to do it. Now, we all do this, but what we sometimes forget is that that makes us curators in a fundamental way of the body of law itself. And I think that's something to look to when you are uh, choosing a casebook. 
It's to look to choose a case at random that you think you're going to teach. And just look at that in four or five different case books. You can't read three 2,000 case, word case page case books, if only there are 2,000 words. Choose a case, look at it, and see whether it includes the material that you think you would want to emphasize in teaching that case. They'll all have the basic reasoning, they'll all have the basic holding, but what else do they emphasize? And that is actually one way to get a sense of the personality of a book, at least in a field where all the case books include a lot of the same material, just presented in slightly different ways. So last but not least, and this is where I wanna conclude, to me, the goal in the classroom is to connect the idea that constitutional law really matters for discussing our deepest questions of how we wanna live as citizens with the body of law and the classroom experience. To do that, I've tried to structure my casebook to facilitate discussion and debate. Now, that debate doesn't have to be debate to the death. I hope that it can be civil debate, but you can't read the constitutional law decisions of our constitutional history without seeing that they are classically framed in terms of majorities and dissents. Now, this isn't always true in every field and it's not relevant for every uh, casebook, but it is absolutely true for constitutional law. So I frame the casebook in the same way I frame the classroom to produce a reasoned, thoughtful disagreement and then try to get people to think about why did the different justices think what they thought and what do I think? Which doesn't have to be what one side or the other side thought, it could be a third thing. And to me, that is the goal. I want my students to come out of every class thinking, wow, I wonder what I think about this. I, I sometimes use the analogy of an art history professor that I had when I was a freshman in college who showed two paintings uh, beside each other and would always say, which one would you take home with you if you could only take one home? And he just did that, he said, to get us into the habit of thinking about aesthetic judgment. Similarly, I, we're trying to teach students to get into the habit of making legal judgments that are not only about what is the law, which is of course an important first step, but what should the law be? And I don't think there's a single student who comes to law school thinking at any law school, I just want to accept the law as it is. Every student thinks and should think, I want to understand the law in order to make the world a better place and in order to attempt to shape the law in whatever way comes to me uh, in the course of my career, whether it's representing indigent clients or billion dollar corporations. In that sense, we all and all of our students share that, that in common. So to me, um, what works pedagogically and what works in a book is to generate presence by discussion that gets people to reveal to themselves and discover for themselves what they really, really think. And believe me, when that works, you know it's working. And when it doesn't work, you know it's not working. I struggled on Zoom, um, but I, uh, I hope that it'll be better in person. Um, and for those of you out there who are trying to choose casebooks in any field, I just want to offer myself, I'm sure the rest of you feel the same. I'm easy to find, um, my, I answer my email, just send me an email. I would be super happy to talk to anybody who's trying to figure out uh, those kinds of things or really any aspect of pedagogy. And I freely give out my syllabi. Um, you, know, you don't have to use my book to use my syllabus, although the page numbers do correspond. Um, and uh, I'm grateful to, to the whole panel for fascinating, fascinating insights. I'd like to thank our panelists. We had six great presentations, all providing a different lens, a different perspective. And now it's time for Q&A. We've already had some great questions in the chat and some suggestions in the chat uh, that were written in. So I encourage everybody to scroll through the chat and look at it, including uh, Miriam pointed out that St. Louis U has a series on teaching in their law reviews. And Tom Baker pointed out that uh, Seattle U had a series on casebooks. But since casebooks has been a central theme here, one of the questions already asked is, uh, how do you choose a casebook? And Noah started talking about that and some others started talking about that. But I know that's a, a big issue for new law teachers. So rather than just pass on by, uh, I open it to our panelists. If you have any other thoughts on your new teacher, how do you pick a book? I'd ask your colleagues, both people have mentioned colleagues, both within your school and elsewhere. You, you probably inter 
viewed at a number of different schools. And so you're building those connections already. Um, generally speaking, as Noah said, we all think our area is the most important and feel kind of sorry for everybody else. So anybody who indulges that fiction and uh, asks us about um, our, our teaching and what we use, whether it's they're using their own book or obviously the vast majority of professors are not using their own books. Um, we just happen to know a lot about the ones we did. Um, that uh, they really, my experience is that um, colleagues I've been on, the permanent member of the faculty of three schools and colleagues are immensely generous in sharing syllabi and and uh, information and and now we're getting to the point where I think it is increasingly sharing quizzes and PowerPoints and poll everywhere and there are all kinds of things to so I would say ask around and um, be aware that as Noah said each book comes with a ideology. And so if you know a little bit about the authors, I can't tell the series apart from each other at all. They all, it all just seems like let's have synergies of something really, you know, a lot of buzzwords. Those series names mean nothing to me. So sorry, Stacy. But the authors do. And once you're familiar with the conference circuit and getting to know people's ideological commitments, you can you can say, okay, this is the thing I want to be a part of. Or sometimes you might not agree and you want to, people sometimes uh, adopt a book they want to teach against. I would just say one other quick thing following up on Martha's excellent point. It's not just, it's also personalities. I mean, I, I at least see the people who use my casebook as a community and they constantly are writing to me saying, change this. And I'm like, okay, I'll change it. And people call me and they say, you know, or they, or they call me and they say like, I'm teaching this case. What do you, you know, how do you teach this case? And we talk about it. I mean, it's just a natural form of connection with people. And um, I think that is actually a great way to do it too. If you know somebody or you want to get to know that person, using their casebook is a great way to do it. Yeah, I would definitely um, reach out to the casebook authors if you have any questions. Um, we actually a website for our casebook, uh, which is sort of immodestly named meritevidence.com, but that was Wes's idea, not mine. Uh, others, I think, may not have a full website, but there's clearly ways to get in touch with the authors. And we, Rick and I, respond to emails both from people who have already adopted the book. As Noah says, you get suggestions and questions, but a lot of time we respond to people who are thinking about whether to adopt the book. And, um, you know, we have no interest in you know, our, our royalties from West are not so high that we're really interested in pushing people to adopt the book. We want people to be happy. And that's why I suggested the comments to also look at the teacher's manual, not just for kind of what help will it give you, but to give you a sense of what this book will be like in practice. Um, how is it that the authors use the book? You may use it differently. Um, I mean, what people said about teaching ideology or learning goals, they really do differ. There are some people who use our evidence book because they don't want to do anything in class other than talk about policy and other kind of building on what the law should be. And they go, oh, well, this is great. The students have already read what the law is, so then I can just talk about what the law should be. And others who use our book because they really want to delve deeply into the doctrine and they want the students to have those rules. So um, you folks have a much harder time now than we did when, um, sorry, Noah, but I'm even older than you. When I picked my book back in 1984, I mean, there was none of this videos and quizzes and there weren't even teacher's manuals for most of these books. <laughs> so it's a hard choice now, but enjoy the decision-making. It's a rich field out there. I was, I was gonna say, it's, it's actually wonderful that we're having this conversation because when I had started, I ended up using the book that I had been taught from and just figured, I don't really know how to make this decision. There are, as Noah was saying, the casebook has thousands of pages. How would I even know what would be best or not? It's really hard to read through the lines to try to figure out maybe what the central themes are. Really difficult to do. And so now there, there really are these wonderful choices as you're alluding to. And I do think taking a look at a sample is great or looking at the teacher's manual just as a shorthand to know whether it's gonna help you advance. I mean, one of the questions that I think was in the Q&A was how do I manage to do everything? Just as a new law professor and trying to write and start a new prep. And so you wanna pick materials that are gonna give you a bit of a step up in terms of not having to reinvent the wheel and having some materials that are already prepared that you feel like you can use. Anyone else on that question? 
So I've heard people talk about uh, mentors and we have a siloed profession. We often do not know what the person in the office next door is doing. And they might even be teaching the same course. And that happens in some schools where you go, you do your own thing and you make it through the whole course and no one else knows how you do. But as I learned, uh, not early enough, but I think mentoring is really important, being a mentor, but also getting mentors. So I'm going to throw that out to you. It was already mentioned a little bit. Did you have mentors? Who'd you get? Well, I think I mentioned the, uh, I, I think I mentioned the professor when I was, when I first started out, the professor who was so helpful with technology because it wasn't something I was familiar with. And so that was just a wonderful opportunity. And, it, and I think I think it, a couple of people mentioned in the in the questions and some of the answers that you don't have to do everything all at once because it's just too much or too overwhelming. But if you take a few things, you know, this time around I'm going to work on a particular area. This time I'm going to build in a quiz, or I'm going to build in some other aspect of this. Or I'm really going to go back and look through those powerpoints. I wasn't happy with how those were last time. It's not something that has to be done immediately or all at once, but something that can be done over time. And I will say, I learned a tremendous amount by mentoring other people. And um, I just recall a new faculty member who came in and was seated in the office next to me, who was also teaching contracts. We went through and a lot of the questions really made me think, okay, well, why was this here? Why was this in the casebook? Or why, why are we doing things a certain way? And it was actually that kind of experience that made me want to work on, on the book that I ended up authoring, because I really, did go back through the material was critical about why things were included and why things were being left out. So I, I think it's in, incredibly important and I'm interested to hear about everyone else's mentors as well. I, um, I've had the experience where I'm the only person teaching a particular topic at my school. So um, one of the things that is, is challenging is to find communities. I think a lot of, you know, we, we interface with the students, but we also silo ourselves in our writing and we we in our scholarship think about our um scholarly communities and if we can find um teaching communities that can be incredibly helpful and our we've organized brown bag lunches for junior faculty to talk about teach we we have that for scholarship but also to talk to talk about um teaching kind of across the board every topic um and during covid one of the things that was has been really there's been a lot of challenges, but what's been really great is um, because this was all so new to us, um, I, I met with a bunch of TNE professors around the country over Zoom to talk about teaching online um, and what can we do. And we all shared materials. And a lot of those connections came from, you know, AALS conference or SEALS conference or any other types of conferences that you can get to where you you meet people and then we, we were in this position where we really needed help. So um, I think it, the, the, there was a lot of natural mentoring and a lot of natural sharing that was um, just, it's it's like we all feel right now where we're listening to our colleagues that can be so um, invigorating regardless of what stage we're at. So I think for new law professors, if, you, if you're reluctant to approach people that you, you might want to be your mentors, it's just as invigorating for the mentors as it is for, for you. I guess we should acknowledge something, which is, I, well, first I'll say I had a wonderful mentor. I was only the third woman on my faculty. And luckily, um, the most senior woman on the faculty was teaching one of the same courses I was hired to teach. So in that field, I was able to get good advice from her. Although I chose a different book. I knew, you know, talking with her made me think more about what I wanted in the classroom. And I chose a book that had more problems built into the book than the one that she was using. I, the other thing I want to acknowledge, though, that some of the people in the audience may be facing an anti-mentoring um, situation. I occasionally hear from new faculty who will say, I would really love to use your book, but the senior person on my faculty doesn't want me to. Um, they really want me to use, I mean, it's not against my book in particular, but, um, or there's another author on my faculty. The senior, you know, the senior person in my field has a book in this field and they're really pressuring me to use it. It doesn't happen a lot and I hope it's not happening to anybody in this audience, but I just want to acknowledge sometimes that people feel that. And I think if that happens to you, um, I would do, you know, I would reach out to other new professors teaching in your area to kind of find out what they're thinking and what kind of be able to sort of test your wings and 
And if it really seems problematic, even it does see if you can find a mentor on the faculty in a different field, or maybe the associate dean to talk through the issue, um, because it, it can be a painful one for a brand new professor. Well, I hope everyone, at least before Martha goes, I was going to talk about this at the end, but every author on this call, and I think most authors around, would be happy to have you call them and contact them about the book. And I think that's a great connection anyway to talk with them because they don't want to feel like they are in isolation either. And so reaching out outside the school, as you're already hearing, I think is another good way to create that teaching community that Deborah was talking about. So I'm just amplifying what's already been said. And I think these are things that I wish all newer law teachers, all law teachers would know. So Martha, you had something to say, please go ahead. You know, I almost was glad you interrupted me because I thought I'm not sure I should say this, but sometimes it seems like that's when you really should say something. I'm very, very glad that Deborah mentioned power disparities because you all are about to and probably are. My guess is that last year you you might be two years into teaching, but because COVID hit, you're just uh, getting this this engagement now. Um, we all interact with within power relationships and you will have power in your classroom over your students and your senior colleagues have power over you and we're all embedded as Noah says in complex cultural relationships so I think in many ways that um, when I was very junior Ian Ayers was an immensely powerful uh, mentor for me um, not so much in teaching me how to teach but other than having had him for a class when I was a student but more like teaching me how to do the scholarship and I think in many ways Jana Singer who just retired as my senior colleague at Maryland was a really important colleague and 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 a mentor not just for teaching she's a phenomenal teacher but mid-career of teaching me how to be engaged in community in a way that in a new way when I made a lateral move and so I think us both being feminists had a lot to do with that feeling. So finding people you trust is really important and identity categories might inform that and, and might not, but um, to, um, I guess I would just say mentoring is delicate and, and to, to reach out and to, and to find people who are crazy about teaching, as you know, um, teaching for a lot of schools is not the coin of the realm, though that it's scholarship. And so those of us who are into this are really into it. And so for being mentored on teaching, I think talking to one of the lunatics who finds it immensely interesting is probably a good idea. I just say one quick thing that Martha reminded me of. It's, this may not be obvious when you start teaching, but some of your best mentors may be people at different schools. Um, and that's just key to remember, and they may not have been your teachers either. So I was mentored very, very actively in a directed fashion by Kathleen Sullivan, who does everything in a very active and directed fashion. Um, she was, you know, the dean at Stanford. I wasn't teaching at Stanford. I hadn't gone to Stanford. Um, but somehow she just decided that I needed guidance and she was going to provide <laughs> it. And then eventually um, it led to she, her adding me to, to the casebook that I subsequently inherited from her. And I had no idea, obviously, that any, any of that would happen. Um, and so, you know, sometimes mentors just appear and when they do, you have to just go for it. And sometimes mentors have very strong opinions about how you should do things. And you have to preserve your independence to the extent you can, but to the extent you can listen, sometimes these folks really know what they're talking about. Um, and so there can be tremendous advantage that comes from that. And I would just throw out one or two quick things. And that is just remember, we on this panel and you too have not really been trained as teachers. My mother was an elementary school physical ed teacher. I realized only when I started teaching that she knew more about teaching than I did by an exponential number and probably did all the way through um, my career. So that it's a learning process and perfect's the enemy of the good. We're gonna stumble, we all do. And we all sometimes have this imposter syndrome. And that is fine. And know that there's always gonna be two or three students in the class who will disagree or not like you for whatever reason. You might look like their old spouse, boyfriend, girlfriend, whatever. And that might be a problem in terms of how they evaluate you, not the teaching. So know that that affects all of us. We are not perfect, even though I think you see really good teachers here who are really accomplished. 
And I hope you along the way still also be you. Don't just borrow everyone else's ideas. I can tell you horror stories about trying someone else's idea that worked for them and it didn't work for me. So I'll just open it up for final comments. And actually, I think we're gonna just end early um, because I think we've had a good session and I like ending on a high note, but any final comments <laughs> from any of our panelists? I will put in a quick plug for not forgetting emeritus faculty when you're looking for mentors. I am just about to retire. Uh, so I'm gonna be in that position of no one uh, doing it for without any pay. And I'm really looking forward to that. I'm retiring in part so I can continue to mentor in the areas that really matter to me. So uh, look for those retired faculty, both on your school and elsewhere. Anyone else, feel free. I'll, I'll just say again, if, if you're new to teaching, meaning you haven't taught this past year and you're, you're teaching in the fall, but good luck. Um, do reach out to people. Uh, you do need to stay connected. Don't, don't try to be an island unto yourself. Um, there's, there's nothing wrong with reaching out and getting help. People help me uh, and I do as much as I can to help other folks. So uh, don't be shy, just, just stay connected. And um, if any of you are going to any conferences, you know, and you see see us, see me in the hallway, just come up, come up to us and say, hey, you were on that that panel. Be happy to talk to you. Well, if there's nobody else, I'd like to thank West Foundation for sponsoring this. I'd like to thank our panelists. What time is it? It's time to start the weekend. Have a great time.